You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Matt Migaki, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while sharing killer craft beers. If you've ever wanted to sneak backstage and share a beer with one of your favorite musicians, well, Vox and Hops is the podcast for you. This week on the podcast, I dropped a killer episode with Johannes Ekström of Avatar. There is this episode and over 440 other ones to help you enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. So what are you waiting for? It's time to become a Vox and Hops head. Cheers. Oh, wow. This is pretty exciting. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the ToneMob.com podcast, the show about guitar tone and the people behind it. As you know, I am your host, Blake Wyland, and with me today, I have Ryan Schaefer of the company I keep talking about because it's so awesome, uh, Hologram Electronics. Hello, sir. Hi. Hi. Is this your first podcast? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I was trying to think of that. Before we started, um, it's definitely my first anything when it comes to the pedal business, for sure. I, I uh, have maybe done a podcast in the past for the band. I'm not sure. But definitely this is the first interview or anything I've done about Hologram, for sure. Yeah, nice. Well, I I actually first heard about you when you, you emailed me. I don't, know, I don't even remember why you emailed me. But I'm so glad you did because, like, I instantly like, well, who's this? What's this hologram electronic stuff? And started doing some digging, and I was like, oh, all right, here's a product video, and that my jaw just hit the floor. And I like sent some messages to my buddies, like, have you seen this? Have you seen this thing? And they're like, no, that looks awesome. And so, uh, and then obviously everyone else thought it was awesome too because you can't seem to keep the things in stock. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm glad you liked it cuz I think the reason I emailed you was because we spent such a long time developing the dream sequence. We didn't really think about what we how we were going to like get people to buy it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like the first week that it came out, I thought, "Huh, I guess I should start uh talking to people who talk about pedals or, and, and that's when I found the podcast and I've been listening to it since then. And, you know, obviously you and I have talked, but, um, yeah, that's probably why I emailed you. <laughs> well, I guess, you know, that makes sense. I, I've been known to help people, uh, figure out how to sell stuff. Um, so I guess that was a good move in some way, yeah. but I think you've, you sort of figured it out on your own. It seems like that, that one almost sells itself. So I've been doing a really terrible job. And before we dig into um, you, which I want to do, um, I do a really horrible job at explaining to people what that pedal actually does. So maybe you can tell everyone my, what I've been stumbling around saying for months. It's a pedal and it does octaves and term stuff, you know. Right. So yeah. maybe you can tell them in yeah. a more concise way what it actually yeah. does. Well, the fact that you have trouble describing what it does means that it's working, uh, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, we just set out to make something that wasn't already represented in in pedals, uh, or uh, that's the way we look at it anyway. Um, but we call it programmable rhythm and octave. So mm -hmm. basically, it's a rhythmic sequencer that uh, gives you control over octave up and octave down. And so you have an envelope generator um, that gives you control over anything from choppy square waves to ramp waves and you can make patterns um based on pitch shifts basically um it includes a lot of patterns that we already made but you also can make your own either directly on the pedal um, by tapping the foot switches with the pattern recorder or you can make your own on the computer so it's it's uh infinitely customizable at that point um it also has um what we're calling a hold sampler um, which just grabs whatever note or chord you play uh, and feeds it into the sequencer so the pattern can keep going. But uh, if you turn up the dry control, you can play on top of it. Um, it also uses um, a digitally controlled analog drive and tone section, which uh, I'm pretty uh, particularly proud of. Um, it's something that uh, 
Jason, my partner, and I worked really, really hard on, especially Jason. He's the hardware designer, uh, among other things. But he and I run the company together. But um, that was a lot of that was his engineering work, which I think is really, really cool. Um, which basically it's a um, an overdrive control that as you crank it up, it compensates the gain. So when while the drive increases, it brings the master volume down. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can actually save those settings digitally or automate them. Um, you can record knob movements on the pedal. Um, but the drive section was one of the things I thought was really cool because just working in recording environments before, um, I know a lot of times I would set up an effect um, with a bunch of different pedals together. And I always liked having a little bit of distortion as a um, to change the tone of it, like to change the timbre, uh, but not necessarily to blast all the pedals that come after it in, in mm -hmm. the chain, you know? Um, and I think that actually it makes it sound a little bit more like a synth, which is part of the, uh, part of the desired effect, right? Like the whole thing sounds kind of like an arpeggiated synth, kind of like a 70s arp or uh or you know like a roland juno or something like that is kind of what we're going for um mm -hmm. but uh yeah so that's there's lots of other things that it can do but i mean uh that's kind of the main goal it's uh but it's also useful for doing tremolo sounds for doing just straight pitch shifter stuff um you can use it as a to kind of just layer um samples uh using the hold sampler so it it does a lot of different things but the easiest way to explain it yeah is, is that it's sort of an arpeggiating pitch shifter uh does that answer your question <laughs> i think that, that's so much better than what i said i'm like you know it does just go watch a video it does a lot of cool stuff like that's yeah what, I'm like yeah. just go watch a but video. that's the best reaction that's mm -hmm. i like it when people because because we wanted to make something that's hard to describe and i hope all of the pedals we make are hard to describe because that's interesting and you know if if people get into it then they'll figure out they can come up with whatever they want to call it on their own you know but uh i i personally uh i i'm glad that you have a hard time describing mm -hmm. it <laughs> well and um just because uh it's difficult to describe shouldn't be there i've seen pedals that are difficult to describe before and that's because they weren't maybe particularly useful so it shouldn't mm -hmm. be dis it shouldn't be confused that like you can't get like musical interesting things out of it it's not you know, I think noise generators definitely have their place, and I've been having a lot of fun with some lately. But this is not technically what that is. It's very, very. You can integrate it in a lot of interesting musical ways. So yeah, yeah. It's not uh, a noise and, device, right? Right, and mm. and that's the thing is that um, one of the design decisions that was really important to us was to integrate the system of really easily being able to save presets um, because I love when you play around with something and you come up with some sort of random sound that you didn't expect and you can make really interesting things happen. But if you can never get back to it again, you know, I don't know how much that helps you. Like that's fun for a certain kind of thing, but coming from a background of being a touring musician, um, I was always trying to design uh, this to be something that you can, it can be there for inspiration when you're writing something, but if you need to get back to it quickly later, you can, um, mm -hmm. which was really important to us to, to build that kind of function out, like that it's actually practical and musical and something you could use on the road. So, right. Right. So, um, let's see, where do I want to go first? Uh, let's go with you first. So, uh, you, you are in a, you were in, maybe sometimes still are in a touring band or why don't you go through your music, musical backstory and kind of, Tell everyone how it led you to starting Hologram. Yeah. Um, well, I, pl I play in a band called Royal Bang. Um, we don't tour anymore, uh, but we still play and write music. Um, but we, uh, yeah, we don't really tour anymore. Um, but we did that for a really long time. Um, I, you know, started playing music when I was a kid, but I uh, was mostly like a keyboard player um, when I was younger. I started playing guitar around high school, I think, um, kind of like middle school, high school. My first, my, like my first rig that I started playing electric guitar through was a. Uh, it was let me see. It was a. It was one of those Epiphone Black Karina Flying V's. Oh yeah, <laughs> and uh, and it was into a DoD distortion pedal into a PV mixer head that my mom used to teach jazzercise. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> into some stereo speakers. It sounded like crap, but I was like, I, w- I was really, really excited uh, to uh, to start with that. But like, yeah, um, uh, speaking of, of gear, I guess, right? That's uh, that's kind of what I started with. But um, I met the other guys from, my, from Royal Bangs uh, in high school. So we were just kind of all, that's like really the only band I've ever been in. I was just always in that band. Um, and we were always like pretty intense about it. Like we, we never were just like a band that got together for fun to, I mean, it was really fun, but we always just wanted to do that. That was the only thing we wanted to do. Um, so we started touring, you know, as soon as possible or, and booking house shows, sleeping on people's floors. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, I was always really, really interested in recording throughout all of that. So we recorded a lot of our own records, especially early on. Um, and I, that's kind of where I got interested in, in making sounds. I mean, I think I come at it a lot more from recording. Um, that's where I kind of got interested in pedals because I never really like performed with a big, huge pedal board or anything. Like I would have a couple, but I got really interested in using pedals um, in the studio kind of ar- around, you know, high school, I think. And then, mm-hmm. um, and, and uh, as the band went on, I mean, we toured all over the place. We went, uh, I mean, yeah, we were doing that from about, I don't know, 2006 or seven to 2014, I think. Um, but yeah, we went all over the place. Like we, you know, toured Europe a bunch. We, uh, Played David Letterman. That was kind of cool. Nice. Um, it's, it was like a, a thing. It, it, well, the thing that's cool about that is that when you're a professional musician, a lot of times like playing in small clubs and stuff, it's hard for your family to understand what you do. But like if you play David Letterman, that's the one thing like your grandparents, anybody, like everyone understands what that is mm-hmm. more than it actually like helps people actually it didn't. It doesn't really make that big of a difference in your career, but, right? <laughs> but it was uh, uh, that that was pretty pretty fun. But um, yeah, pops yeah, like, can say like, "Hey, my, yeah, my son was on Letterman. Did you see it? Right. He was on Letterman. Yeah. Letterman of all things. Can you believe yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because there's a lot of other stuff we were doing, like crashing on random people's floors and stuff that was not not super relatable, and people don't really understand how that's making a living. Um, but uh you know that's one people <laughs> understand but um yeah so we, i don't know we made like uh four records i guess um and throughout all of those i was always really really interested in the recording part of it um the first first one we recorded on our own and the second one i recorded a lot of it and we kind of did it in the studio and just being exposed to a lot of different um gear in these different studios i got really into making these kind of um crazy sounds where i would chain a bunch of pedals together or use synths or um i kind of felt like that was one of my strengths was um just combining tools to make these really interesting sounds and i got really into the idea of like okay once i do that like how do i take that with me you know Mm -hmm. Uh, we'd make these really cool sounds on the records but we had to figure out some way to actually do it live so we spent a lot of time um, messing around with uh, laptops and Ableton Live. And it's funny because now it's it's not uncommon at all to see uh, a laptop on stage with a band. But I remember when we started doing it, it was like almost controversial. It was weird. I mean, it's not that long ago. It was like 2007, 2008. And we would play places and people would kind of like boo the computer you know like even though it's just doing like really noisy stuff um but that's kind of like we got really interested in in taking these sounds we made on recordings with us live and then we started getting into stuff like running the guitars into the computer running the bass into the computer and so we started doing kind of crazier and crazier effects when we were i was actually making like custom patches on the computer um to manipulate the guitar sounds um and at one point we were just we went down from being five people to a three piece Mm -hmm. and i ended up playing bass in the band by doing just a regular guitar into the computer and i would do like a pitch shift down into a bass amp and like uh, an octave like a regular octave guitar into a guitar amp so we got really into like routing stuff all over the stage and we would sometimes turn two of the amps into like a stereo amp for the guitar player and other times 
have it be something that I could use. Um, and, you know, around that time, we also, I also got really interested in electronics. So um, I built uh, like a MIDI controller for us to control guitar effects for our guitar player, Sam, to control them. Um, and one of the things that I noticed the longer we would tour is that people would come up, um, we, you know, we'd play sort of a bigger show or something and, and people would come and like want to take pictures of the pedal board and stuff. And people would be really bummed out because they'd just be like a gray box with four buttons on it. And be like, what is that? That's not a pedal or whatever. And be like, oh, it just connects to the computer. And people would be like, boo. <laughs> <You know>? like, <laughs> they didn't think it was cool. Um, but it's like they really liked the sounds and they heard them, but people were kind of biased against computers for some reason. But um, anyway, so, I mean, that was a few years ago, but I think, you know, ever since then, I'd always kind of kicked around the idea of what if I could take some of these really crazy sounds and then actually just, you know, distill that into something that people could buy or something that people could use. Because the pro like the prospect of using a laptop for most people is really intimidating. And it took a lot of work to get it to work in a live setting. And it's also, it's overkill for most people. And it kind of takes some of the fun out of it too. You know, like collecting pedals is fun. You know, getting a computer to work in a live set setting is, is not necessarily. Um, so yeah, I guess that's how the music stuff kind of ties into Hologram. Um, right. The other thing to note, I guess, is that Jason, the guy that I um, uh, build pedals with, you know, the guy that started the company, um, with me he was actually briefly the bass player for the band a long time ago um, and he kind of left to do his engineering job full-time but um, we always have been friends so uh, you know kind of when we slowed down touring a little bit he and I kind of reconnected on this idea and so um, yeah it's like two years ago we kind of transitioned from the music stuff to you know I, I kind of did a little bit less of that and started working on on pedals uh, full-time i guess so like the dream sequence was that born from some of the stuff you guys were already doing like sound wise like you you were already kind of replicating some of these patterns and octave ups and things or was that just an entirely new idea in itself it was based a little bit on um we never did that effect exactly but we did some stuff that was kind of like that from time to time um, and we were always really big into those boss PS five pitch shifters. Um, at certain points we'd have like, we had two guitar players that both had them and they would do like a lot of parts where like using the pitch shifter was, was integral to it. So I know we, that was like a sound that we were always into. Um, and one of the, like, um, like there was a period of time where I got really into, um, just kind of using, do you know what an Arduino is? Have you ever heard of that before? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Just recently I learned what that is, but yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, you know, um, a microcontroller that you can plug into the computer and run code on it. Um, I started messing around with using that to control, to make little MIDI controllers or to control other effects. Just when we were recording our third record, I guess, we kind of had a long time in the studio. So I would like every day try to come in with some weird little variation. Like I made a a joystick that would chop up the audio and randomize a bunch of samples. Or I would make, you know, just like, I just kind of cobble something together on a breadboard and just bring it in to mess with in the studio to see if it would give us an idea. And one of the ones that I did was something that kind of was like a really rudimentary sequencer for one of those pitch shift pedals. Um, and uh, it didn't work very well at all, but it kind of always got me thinking, it's like, man, this would be really cool if you could have a sound like this but actually it was a full featured arpeggiator. Um, so yeah, it, it, it has a little bit to do with that, but that wasn't ever what the dream sequence does was probably would probably be a little bit more complex than the kinds of sounds we used when we played live. Okay. Gotcha. Interesting. <clears throat> so the, the dream sequence, I mean, obviously you're talking, you had some programming and an electronics knowledge and obviously Jason had s some engineering background. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of regardless of that, the dream sequence is still a pretty ridiculously ambitious first outing for a company. Uh, you know, it's it's a big departure from a, what somebody might normally who builds pedals might normally start with, like a fuzz face or something. You know, it's right. A, was that ever? I mean, obviously that was intentional, but was it? Um, was it ever kind of daunting to try to make something that big a reality? Uh, 
you know, for, especially for your first thing. Yeah, it was it was only Dante. <laughs> 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 because like we when we started working on it, um I think that we just didn't know how much we didn't know. So we otherwise if we if we had known at the beginning how much stuff we were going to have to learn to make this, we would not have started, you know. Basically, we kind of like had a couple ideas from the few things that I knew about programming. Jason had some ideas about how to do this or that. And we drink a couple beers and be like, yeah, man, let's do this. And then we'd like order some parts and start messing around. It was like, oh, I guess, well, I guess we don't really know how to do this. And then, okay, well, all right, let's just go learn how to do that. And then we'll come back. And then we, so we get that. We each work on our own things. We come back to it. We order another prototype. It's like, okay, well, that works, but this doesn't work. And then it just sort of went on to like, you know, a year and a half later, it's like, oh, man, like I had no idea there were all these things I was going to have to learn too. But we just, I don't know, you know, like neither of us had ever built a pedal at all before, you know, when we started working on it, we just thought it would be a cool idea. Um, so that's the power of Google and, and strong coffee, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so, so you had not built, I mean, I was kind of just thinking about, you know, first pedal for production. So you hadn't actually even built a pedal at that point, like not even no. a kit or anything. Mm -mm, nothing wow <laughs> nope <laughs> that's super impressive that's yeah that's a that's a that's insane um, other than yeah other than building like a midi controller kind of but uh i mean really actually the project that jason and i worked on right before we started working on the pedal the reason that made us think to do one of the things that made us think to do it um was that i ended up building this wireless lighting system for the band mm -hmm. um and as Jason and I were living together at the time, actually, and uh, he, um, I mean, I'm sure it was, it was, I actually, I know it was super annoying for him because I was like, I really needed help making this. And I was also like prototyping it in his living room. So he'd come home from work every day and there'd be like fog and lasers and stuff going on. And he was really nice and would like help. He would help me with it. And he'd be like, you know, maybe, maybe you should think about doing this or maybe you should think about using this kind of battery. And, and, um, he put up with it for for a long time but what it ended up being really cool and you know we started thinking it's like what if we did something you know where we worked together like this but it was something we could sell you know so right um because the the midi lighting thing was sort of a one-off it would be way too much work to uh to 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 build for other people but it was it was pretty cool i mean it was a it was a wireless um it was a wireless MIDI system with all these battery powered lights because we were on kind of these, the band was on sort of these bigger tours and we couldn't afford to bring a lighting person with us. Um, mm -hmm. So we thought like, what if we just make these like super bright lights that are battery powered that we can basically just like stick all over the stage right before we start playing. And then we can control them ourselves just as a purely budgetary thing. And it ended up, it, it looked really cool, but it made it a lot less fun to play. So we stopped using them, but it was like, that was my first like electronics exercise, I think. And that's when Jason and I started working together. So, um, it was, it was, you know, it was, that's kind of what led us to start working on the pedals, I, I think actually. So what was it about the lighting that made it less fun to play? I'm curious. Was it just the hassle of having to set it up or what, what was the deal? No, well, not, it wasn't really that. It was just that I, I came up with these extremely complicated, like, light sequences of like every single part of the song had its own thing so instead of like so i'm like tapping a foot switch or tapping a button to go to the next light part and it just became really distracting from actually playing music oh okay <laughs> so we only we used it on like two tours and then we're kind of like all right let's just go back to uh let's just go back to playing music <laughs> <laughs> i see it all makes sense now however well, however okay. if you watch our product video there's like uh, some flashing lights in the background mm -hmm. behind the pedal. Those are those lights. So I did still use them for something. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> that that was a very distinctive part of the video too. So that's that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, another thing that 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 about the presentation of that pedal is that video is really really well done, and I think that probably is a kind of a a driver for like interest. Because I know as soon as I watched it, I was like, you guys got to check this out. So it, I think, uh, I know, well done on that too. Yeah, everything, everything out the get go has been very well done. So, oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean that video is. Um, luckily, it was. I just kind of uh, called up the 
there's two guys in town um, who did uh, really, really awesome music videos for the band. And they had never done like a pedal video or anything before. Um, and they had a really cool approach to doing it. So I can't take too much credit for that. But um, yeah, I mean, I think like we just tried to make it interesting to watch even if you don't like watching pedal demo videos or as close to that as possible. Right, right, right. It's very cool. It's very cool. So now maybe we need to dig into that thing a little more. People have been going nuts. So you you released your first batch of 50 and it sold out. And then your second batch. Like how long did it take for that to sell out when you announced it? Um, I don't know. I know all of the... I know the first one sold sold out in a couple of days, and then it, there were quite a few batches there that it would be like in the in the minutes. Um, it was pretty it was pretty nuts. It'd be like thirteen minutes or something. And there was one the fastest that ever, or like the craziest that ever was. There was one batch of fifty that sold out in three minutes, which was just kind of insane. It was that was just like two days of answering angry emails from people like those that that's too much so we tried to slow it down a little bit <laughs> yeah that's that's nuts i i've never heard of i've never heard of it happening with such a new company and new product uh but there again i think that goes back to you know you did you did the time on it so it the you know the interest level of the people is going to be there that's it's, you can't just go to Guitar Center and pick one up, you know. It's not right. A, yeah, it's it's not a TS nine. So, um, yeah. I think that's probably why those things happen. But uh, yeah, yeah. So, what are some of your favorite ways to use that pedal? Like, I mean, I know you have your factory presets, but like, if you're gonna use it to write music with your band, which I'm sure you uh. probably have at this point, do you have kind of a some you know, interesting ways to set it up or how do you use it? Well, uh, we actually haven't used it a ton yet. Um, but I know that one of the, the arpeggiation stuff is always something that we've been trying to do. So I know that's going to be, um, uh, big for us. I've just been so busy building them that we haven't actually spent much time playing music, (laughs) but, um, but I actually really also like the tremolo, just like the tremolo features on it. Um, and, uh, because I, I think it makes like a, I think the combination of tremolo and a little bit of drive in there is uh, is really awesome. And, and I like that. Um, I think one of the things we try to be really sensitive to is that like this pedal. I mean, obviously, uh, it's an expensive pedal, right? I mean, like, mm-hmm. um, and it can do a lot of stuff. But we try to pack as much musical stuff and like useful stuff in there as possible, rather than just complications, right? Like, because. Mm-hmm. I mean, the arpeggiator stuff is really awesome, and I think that there's certain people that's just going to really speak to. Um, but not everybody's going to use it all the time, right? So our idea was to like break out all the relevant parts into their own function. So I also really, I think it tra- the pitch shifter tracks really well. I also like just using it as a pitch shifter because um, you can do just the octave down. I think the random mode is probably one of my uh, favorites, um, yeah, which basically I love just random. you know. Yeah, like just kind of cycles through the octave down and the octave up, um, which is weird because that's the last thing I added to the pedal that wasn't originally on there. And it was just I sort of wanted to put one more mode on there and I was kind of on the fence about what to do or should I add another subdivision or something. And I thought, OK, I'll put this random mode in there. Um, but I didn't think that much about it. And then that's like one of the things that people seem to like the most about it, actually. It it seems to it's random, but it it. It works so well. Um, I don't know. It just, I get like really, in, we keep saying this word musical over and over again, but I get really musical things out of it. When you you think random, that's not usually what you think. You don't think musical. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of surprisingly useful, that mode is. Um, and how it makes you play. Uh, it, it definitely changes the way you play, especially that mode. And uh, yeah. I find it really interesting. That's awesome. So, well, that's good to hear, yeah. <laughs> Um, I tried it. I I think you may have seen it. I tried it with the, uh, well, we were talking about noise devices earlier. Here's one. I was trying it with the Electro Faustus drone thing instead of a guitar. Right. (laughs) And I was, it was like, it was so fun. I could make the craziest, uh, it was, but that thing's like really scary sounding at times. And, Uh and the dream sequence seemed to, make it 
nicer. Uh-huh. <laughs> like somehow, like the the rhythm and the pattern added to that, you know, like seemed yeah. to just kind of smooth things out and make it. Don't get me wrong; it still sounded like a horror movie, but not as horror movie esque, I guess. Yeah, uh, really yeah. fun combination to use. It yeah, with. that thing looks awesome. I'd love to play around with the one sometime. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's another cool thing that I like to use it for. I, I think I remember kind of trying to describe this technique to you whenever you got the pedal. But um, one of the things I think is really cool is to just make a loop of unrelated stuff, like not necessarily even rhythmic stuff. I'll, I'll like turn on the looper and just play a bunch of notes um, and it'll sound kind of chaotic. But then you turn the mix down, the dry mix down on the dream sequence and it'll just kind of take whatever chaos you put it into the front of it and sort of organize it into a rhythmic loop. But, you know, uh, especially if the timing's not synced up, it's just sort of like a harmonic change that happens over, like it'll be this pulsing rhythm, but the chords are kind of in a different place in the beat every time. And uh, I think there's some really interesting stuff you can do with that. I really like that kind of, kind of organizing chaos a little bit into, into a rhythm, I think is, is sort of interesting. Yeah, I remember you telling me about that and I completely spaced it. I need to try that. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a good way to use it, I think. I have a feeling that's going on Snapchat later. So Cool. <laughs> For anyone who, well, it'll probably already be gone, but I'll do it again sometime. So Snapchat, <laughs> the tone mob, you'll you'll find me doing idiotic things on there. Uh so yeah, that's really cool. I keep forgetting about that. That is a that is a really fun kind of technique. Um the recording the knob movements. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if we've ever spent this long talking about one pedal on the show before, but the <laughs> <laughs> recording the knob movements I found really fun, especially with the wave shape side and the drive yeah. side. Yeah. Um, and kind of like using the drive almost. It doesn't do the volume obviously, but using the drive almost as a swell. Right. Uh, yeah. It's just. And then as the wave gets choppier and choppier, I don't know, it's it's really interesting. So, I don't know. Was was that something like you anticipated a lot of use out of or what do you think? Cuz I I didn't think when you told me about it, I'm like I'm not going to use that that much. But right. when I tried it, it was a whole nother ball game. Yeah, well, I mean, that actually uh speaks to a different point kind of in how we designed it. It's like one of the things that um uh i think is so awesome about working with jason on this is that i so i mostly did the software and he did the hardware design and we you know obviously collaborated on a lot of it you know um in the middle sort of um but one of the great things about having somebody to bounce this i these kinds of ideas off of is that jason was always really insistent on like Basically, you can put as many features in this as you want, but when you pull it out of the box, you have to make it do some really cool stuff without having any idea how it works, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that really kept it in check and probably, I don't know, I think think his kind of insistence on that point is what probably turned it from being a really complicated kind of lame pedal into a really, something that I think is much nicer. I mean, I think it's probably having that balance because I'd go crazy on being like, oh, look at what I can do. Look at all these features I can make. But if you don't have somebody to tell you, hey, like, you know, make sure that this is still fun to use <laughs> or whatever, then. Um, but knob recording was one of those things where I, I thought that was like, this is a really deep feature. But the idea still has to be that, like, I mean, I assume no one's going to use that right out of the box. But the idea being that you can have a lot of fun with it and then you can basically choose to learn as much or as little about the pedal as you want. Like, if you want to dig into it, there's a ton of stuff to find out. And there's a ton of stuff that it can do. And we have the whole big user manual and there's all kinds of stuff um, you can you can create with it. But it's also not necessary. So um, we can't expect everybody to engage it on that level. Um, mm-hmm. But the knob recording thing was is one thing that I was pretty proud of. like Because I think that's where you can um, take one of the preset patterns and really start to customize it and make your own sound you know um by just adding these kind of small variations in the sound you can really create a lot of interesting textural stuff in my opinion for sure most definitely yeah and that was a really i'm glad that jason was insistent on that because i think it's our it's kind of intimidating if you haven't tried it yet but as soon as Uh you 
start messing with it, it becomes instantly less so. Um, and that speaks to something I've actually, I can't take credit for this because, because I didn't come up with a concept, but, um, talking with the guys over at solid gold effects and one of their philosophies is to, is, is called the, what, what it was referred to me as the five second rule. I don't know if they invented it or not, but uh, it sounds really smart to me. And that is regardless of the pedal and regardless of what it's supposed to do, you need to be able to take it out of the box and within five seconds have a good sound out of it. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's the sound, maybe it's not the sound you're looking for, but a good sound. Like, right. And I think right. that's a, that's something I've repeated to other builders because they're like, oh, I want to add, just like you said, like feature creep sets in. I want right. to add, you know, this kind of clipping and this kind of clipping and this and that. And I want to have a master volume and then I want to have four different whatevers and, a, you know, interactive EQs and like, okay. But the, the solid gold five second rule should definitely come into play here when you start getting super complicated, I think. But, yeah, uh, you know, I definitely I definitely agree with that. Yeah, cuz no one's ever going to find out those really cool features if they don't, you know, if that 5 second rule doesn't apply. If it's not cool to start with, what's going to encourage them to to explore it? Right. And I think I've I've seen pedals die or not just pedals, but you know, guitar gear in general kind of die on the vine with consumers just because um it was too ambitious, like or uh -huh. or maybe maybe it's too easy some, there's some things that it's almost beneficial to limit what it can do because it's too easy to get bad sounds out of it. Right. And, har oh, and, harder, to, and harder to get good ones. And there's a pedal I have in my collection that actually fits that, and I'm trying to remember which one it is. But um, it sounds really good if you said it just right, but it's easy to get gross sounds out of it. And I don't remember what – and not the good kind of gross. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> so I can't remember yeah. what it is now. But, yeah. Um. I mean, I think that's what, when I think about technology that I really like to use, and a lot of times relating it to just synth technology or whatever, you know, it's like, I, I think that like that last per couple percentage points that make the difference between it being something that's cool into something that's really great, it's, that's the hardest part. It's like takes forever to, to make these little tweaks. You know, I, I there was just so much stuff when we're working on the pedal where we're, we're saying like you're just slightly tweaking these filter values and listening to it over and over and over again, or or just I mean I probably spent a month on just the the way the curves interact on that drive control, which sounds crazy. That's a really long time to work on it, but I think it sounds awesome. And mm -hmm. you know that's the kind of um, time we like to put into things. We want to make something that is really um, it feels like everything's in the right place. You know, like when you turn the drive up, it does kind of what you'd expect it to do. I hope. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, but that, that, that thing, that, that part of it is difficult for sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So was there anything other than like the, the arpeggiations and things you'd messed with in the past? Was there other things that inspired you or just other builders or anything? Like, where did you draw that from? Cause like people don't just come up with that stuff. Do you mean uh, the technical side of it, or or the? Uh... I, it can be technical, or it could be just kind of. Well, I really like the spirit of, mm. I don't know, Mike Matthews or somebody. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I'm just well, kind of definitely, definitely. Um, I got to be pretty good friends with um Jamie and Julie from Earthquaker Devices. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually don't know them through pedals. Um, I knew them because Jamie used to be the uh road manager for the black keys and uh we toured with the black keys um that's where i met him at first and then he he kind of after the tour was over i i think you know uh or at the very end kind of mentioned that he made pedals or whatever right and that was obviously a long time ago um he's only uh making pedals now. well actually he probably doesn't even make pedals anymore i don't think he just designs <laughs> awesome stuff um but yeah they're they're a really inspiring story and and super nice people um, we used to stay at their house every time we'd play uh, in Akron. And I remember seeing um, kind of we'd go back every year. And, you know, the first year it was just a couple of guys like coming over to Jamie's house, um, making them in the basement. And then we'd come back and they're kind of at a bigger place. Uh, and then it seems like now I haven't seen their new facility, but it seems like they're in an even, even bigger shop now and they have tons of employees. And I mean, I, I love all the stuff that they make. Um, 
they've got this one pedal called uh, Talons. I don't know. Have mm-hmm. you ever played with, around with that one? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. I, I have used that on so many recordings, and I always recommend it to people because uh, I don't like to have a lot of pedals. You know, I, I, I mean, uh, I like to keep things as minimal as possible, kind of. And um, that one, you can just make so many different sounds, especially in a recording environment. Um, if I was doing like production work or whatever, that'd be the first thing I would pull out if we needed to fix a guitar sound because you can completely uh, shape the EQ. You can dial in exactly what you need from the gain and presence. And I just think it's a really nice pedal. Like it's it's really well designed and super useful. Um, and then obviously they have a lot of crazy modulation stuff too that, that I really like. Um, but I always thought that Talon's one and the speaker cranker, I always thought were just really well made, like uh, really useful pedals. Mm-hmm. Oh, I agree. Yeah, I I don't have enough Earthquaker stuff myself. I only have like three, but mm-hmm. they're so good. Like, yeah, <laughs> the, there's a reason why that company is doing doing well, and it's because like everything they come out with is is just that good. Um, I have the Afterneath and the uh, Bit Commander. Yeah, and- that's a great one. Oh, the bit commander is so fun. Um, and then the uh, just recently got the Nightwire, which is just a trip. And actually, uh, actually used it with the dream sequence in a, a couple snaps ago. Uh, and that oh, was nice. really, really, really fun. Like staging. I, I had a, I had at, at one time I had, a, it was basically three different styles of tremolo because there was the um, Mr. Black uh, deluxe plus which mm-hmm. is a trem trem reverb, and then that was first into the uh, dream sequence, and then into the nightwire, and I was getting crazy. It was so fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it sounds that's, nuts. That's one of the things I like to do is kind of stack, um, stack things in a way that you're not supposed to. Mm-hmm. Um, why would you stack three tremolos on top of off each other? I don't know because it sounded cool. Uh, yeah (laughs) so i don't know if i quite follow the minimal setup although it would probably be beneficial to me to remember that once in a while yeah well i only feel that way whenever i'm playing live i just don't like to have a lot of stuff that can break but whenever um whenever i would do studio stuff which is mostly when i'd mess around with pedals it was like absolutely maximal (laughs) i think probably (laughs) we just have as much uh crazy stuff as we could you know like we I mean, uh, I yeah, I, I don't think there are any rules when it comes to that kind of stuff. Those are always my favorite kind of sounds, like you know, putting three things that don't seem like they should go together, or or just bad gear in general. Like, yes. I, I really love bad gear. Like, uh, I just think that like that's where you get. I, I know that like even going all the way back to high school, like um, Chris, the drummer for our band, like he and I were both obsessed with like small drum kits. Or drum kits that had stuff in them, you know, to make them sound <laughs> terrible. Like, yeah. just like, what can you do with a small drum kit when you're recording it to just make it sound like it's exploding? Or, or I, I don't know. I, I think that, like, I've never been super snobby about gear. And, and I think that, in fact, I maybe go the other way. Like, I really love bad gear, usually, or just garbage gear mm-hmm. like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I like the challenge of trying to make something cool come out of a uh, stuff that's not supposed to sound good um or things that you're not supposed to use like um on the third record that we did i got really into using an old um auto tune rack unit okay like like one of the f- the first i don't know if it was a software plugin or a hardware thing first i kind of feel like it was maybe hardware first but either way it sounded like garbage mm-hmm. and uh the guy that we were um, working with is this great recording uh, engineer and producer. His name's Scott Miner. Um, he had been in the band Sparkle Horse, and it was something that they had acquired for years and years ago, like an original one. And he was like, "Yeah, it sounds terrible." Like, and I was like, "Oh, let's plug it in." <laughs> <laughs> and and I ended up just using it to make like I I plugged basically a mic into that, and then a MIDI controller, I think, and then. We plugged it through a bunch of guitar pedals and just used it as a really crazy sounding vocoder um, and layer it on top of each other. Um, and, you know, there's other ways to get that sound, but I always really like like something that's not supposed to sound good or something that people co- would kind of go like, ugh, 
when they hear about it, that's exciting to me. Like if you can try to turn that into something really cool. You know? Oh yeah. I can, I, I love your thought on that. Like I have a thing, uh, for cheap pedals. Like I love like uh-huh. all those junky old, uh, DODs things that are like kind of jankety and don't work very well. And, and like, I mean, don't get me wrong. Some of those actually sound really, really good and they're highly underrated, but some, like some of them are just a joke. Um, but like recently I got this PV uh, chorus. It's like dual PV chorus. It's like hot awesome. pink. Yeah, it's hot yeah. pink. And it's got uh, this big old like the, the switch to, t- you know, the foot switch to turn it on is like this big old like I, the way I describe it is like a Reebok air bump air, you know, pump shoe bubble. Nice. Like that's, <laughs> it's what it looks like. It, it's like this soft rubber pad. <laughs> With that's the, the original the, that's the original soft touch switch <laughs> it, it's what it feels like it's like yeah it's totally soft touch and it's it looks it looks ridiculous but it actually sounds really it sounds really really good and you can do a lot of crazy stuff with it so uh there's there's a guy and a listener um on uh i don't know his real name i don't think i probably should but his instagram handle is uh, tone underscore co and he is kind of inspired me to like revisit some of these 80s you know 80s stomp boxes that are like super cheap i like picked this yamaha distortion up the other day it was in it it's, it's i think it's an, a rat clone of some sort and it just sounds so stupid but in the best way possible um, yeah so. yeah i love stuff like that yeah just like old weird Gear. I know one piece of gear that we were obsessed with for a little while. It was the dumbest thing. It was so it was so dumb, but I loved it. It was this <laughs> little like I think it was I don't even Yamaha maybe. It mm-hmm. was like a little battery powered sampler, and it had it's like kind of from the mid nineties or something, and mm-hmm. uh, it had a bunch of like drum pad buttons on it. But then it had this like scratch strip. Where I think they were trying to take advantage of like people's interest in hip hop or something, where right. you could just like scr- you could like take the sample and you could scrub it back and forth with your finger. But I think it's meant to use it like you know, like the interlude in a Limp Biscuit song or something, where they just be like the, <laughs> that DJ shows up for like one part where he's just like, "This is my this is my part of the song." I think that's what it was for. But we got really into using it because. It, it, like it didn't even have the right inputs for it. We had to like match the impedance and stuff. But we'd we'd run uh, a guitar through it and then basically do almost like Johnny Greenwood style, like chop and reverse kind of stuff, where you could live sample on it, and it was insane sounding. Like it was so cool. I know that's totally not what they meant it for, um, but uh, it was yeah, it was a total piece of crap, and like it eventually just <laughs> broke. Um, but I love stuff like that. Also, because it came loaded, I bought it used and it came loaded with a bunch of samples from the previous owner. And I have no idea what kind of gig that dude was doing. But it just, <laughs> it had, it just had, it just like the first bank. The rest of them had like drum samples on it. But like the first bank, like when you turned it on, was just this sample of like a pitch down voice going, house music. Just saying house music like that. And that was just it. Like that was all he needed was just that button. Um, and and I remember uh, Sam, the guitar player for our band, he and I just kind of like hitting it over and over again and being like, what was this guy doing? Or was it that he just was like, he loaded one sample in and it was that one. And that was his first one. And he was like, man, it's a real, it's a real pain to load samples into this. Like I give up. And then he sold it. Maybe that was the last thing he did. Well, or maybe that's all know. he needed it for. Maybe right. just, he, yeah. he just needed it to say house music, like right. in the middle of the song in case the people listening didn't remember what it was they were listening to. Right. Right. They, may, yeah. they might forget like, <laughs> Oh yeah. We're at a house music show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think whatever gig you're, doing if someone has to tell you what kind of music you're listening to it's probably not a good sign for the audience or the band <laughs> no, yeah what is this again uh, wow this yeah. is yeah this is an elvis cover band what yeah like if neither of them know that that's a bad sign i think you're right yeah you know i agree <laughs> good i don't think i've ever been in that situation and i hope hope I n- i'm never on either side of that equation <laughs> I, <laughs> could be really really awkward um <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> i'm just i'm just picturing you just hitting this button over and over again house yeah yeah i think it's uh but yeah i'm f- I'm firmly pro garbage gear i think that's 
I think it's always a cool place to start. We would always try to like do weird recording experiments when we were making records to just get just borrow stuff from our friends or like get stuff on uh you know Craigslist or whatever and and um like one of my favorite pedals that I, I've still got it but it's a um the an old Electro Harmonics Qtron mm-hmm. um like in the in the big aluminum enclosure from I guess they're probably all aluminum but you know what I'm talking about like the old style one I don't oh, know yeah. when it's from um, but I remember I got one and it's just straight up broken. Like, and I got it for really cheap because they were like, well, there's something wrong with it, but we don't know what it is, but it sounded so cool. Like if you, you kind of could never get to do the same thing twice and it is definitely broken, but it would just make this like howling sound sometimes. And we used it all over the, you know, the record we'd use it for synth sounds or, or whatever, you know, and, um, that stuff. Yeah. I, that's always not not that a Qtron is garbage, but that one was about to be garbage. Someone was going to get rid of it for sure, and uh, I, I really like that one. But you can't you can't ever make it do the same thing twice. But it does what it does well usually. You still have it, yeah, yeah, nice. And it's still it's still on the fritz, but not totally broken. I love that. Yeah, yeah. It's like there's something wrong with the with the drive channel, or it's got like a little drive switch, and I can mm-hmm. never tell if the drive is engaged or not. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it seems like it, it, it isn't. I don't know, or maybe it'll just kind of come on intermittently. Um, but I don't want to open it up because I feel like I know I know how pedals work now, so I might, you know, fix it. <laughs> or well, maybe maybe you would uh, be able to replicate it. Yeah, that's a good like, idea. Actually, figure yeah, out figure yeah. out why it's doing what it's doing, and then maybe you, that could be your next thing. Yeah. So like the we br- build an exact clone of a Qtron. And then break the drive switch off and see what happens and sell that. <laughs> to people. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I yeah. think so. I I don't see yeah. how that could possibly fail. Yeah, I, no, it's a, that's a great it's great idea. Sort of like the same concept as when people relic guitars. Mm-hmm. We could do that to pedals. We could make like a perfectly nice clone of an of a Qtron and then just beat it up. And then when you buy it, um, you sort of you get a road worn pedal. Yeah, and you have to charge more for it. Right. Oh, yeah, we charge way more. Way more. Like triple. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's got legs. I think so. I think this, well, let's let's talk. I think we can get some investors involved. I think, uh, right. I think this is the the next thing. This is, right. We're on to something here. I think we should take it to Shark Tank. You (laughs) You think Mark Cuban will bite on it? I don't know. I've never actually watched Shark Tank before, but it's something we were talking about at the shop the other day. How, like, anytime you talk to someone, who's like, I don't know, like somebody's family member or you're trying to explain to them, somebody who's not familiar, like the just the, the anytime anyone now like hears that uh, you have an invention or a business idea, they're like, oh, you should go on Shark Tank. As if that's just like the way that you start a business now in America. Right. <laughs> it's, it's just like, well, you've got to go. It's like you got to get your LLC and you got to file taxes with the state and mm-hmm. you got to go on Shark Tank. And then after yep. that, you're in business. So, yeah, you're good um, after that. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You got to go on there. You got to have the FUBU guy weigh in on his opinion on your, your stuff. And then after that, you're set. Is that, who need. are the judges on, on Shark Tank? I've never seen uh, that. So it's, I've, seen, I've watched it a bunch, and I should actually know him by name. It actually is a pretty entertaining show. I got yeah. to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Uh, it's actually a really good TV show. Uh, there's a, there's the, they actually kind of say things... They kind of, they tell people like, not how to run a business, but like stuff that normal people would probably have never heard of before. Like, what do you mean? What's a conversion rate? You know, Uh, or something like that. But it's, so it's kind of cool because I I don't know, I have my own opinions on business being taught in schools and whatever. We won't go on that tangent. But uh, the guy, so Mark Cuban's obviously on it. He's probably the most famous. Um, Is it Damon? John? I don't remember his last name. I can't remember any of their names, but one guy is the founder of FUBU. Damon hmm. something. Uh, and then the rest of the people, I don't know. I don't know where they came from, Like, but they got lots of money. And they right. know how to run a business. So, there yeah. you go. Fair enough. Well, maybe we should go on Shark Tank with relict pedals. <laughs> Wyland Schaefer, relict pedals. Right, right. Pre-broken. Lovingly pre-broken. Lovingly pre-broken in Knoxville, Tennessee, by hand, yeah. by right. hand, by hand. Yeah, by yeah. people who care. Yeah, that reminds I, me yeah. of the of the artisanal firewood video. Did you see that? No. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, handcrafted artisanal fire firewood. Uh, they they pick each piece out by hand. They shave it down to just the right. You know, you know, it's a it's an art, really. It's it's much more than a, your average piece of firewood. Uh, you know, this is a it, real this is a real thing, or this is like a funnier <laughs> diet. No, it's no, it was a it was. Well, I don't know. I shouldn't say that. I hope it's not a real thing, but. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was a fake, yeah, funny or die or something, but it was quite funny. Like logs yeah. were like three hundred dollars for like one log. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That seems that seems only slightly implausible. Like I would maybe believe. That's why I couldn't tell. I mean, I would I would believe that. Yeah, There's somewhere. Yeah, I, could, I could see somebody in William, Williamsburg or or even my neck of the woods in Portland paying an excessive amount of money for artisanal firewood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like something plausible. Hmm. So. On that bombshell, what a way to... <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, we're getting really close uh, to the end here. So I think a good way to wrap it up, as always, is to tell people um, where they can find you on the interwebs, your various social medias, and all that stuff. Yeah, we're um, hologram underscore electronics on Instagram. Um, and our website is hologramelectronics.com. Um, right now, uh, at least for the, the, the time being, um, our pedals are all just coming out in batches. So if you are interested in buying one, they're kind of, um, just out of stock for the foreseeable future. But, uh, the best way to get one is to sign up for the email list there. And we kind of, uh, it's not a waiting list. We just send out an email blast whenever we have, um, new pedals you know a couple times a month and uh it's kind of first come first serve so um yeah that's where to find us on the internet all right perfect uh right so that link will be in the show notes and like yeah seriously you guys gotta you gotta get on the email list over there because you know i had lots of people actually when i post they're like oh how can i get one i'm like well you better Get on the email list over there because that's the first place they blast it and they usually are gone after that. So, um, yeah, that would be my advice if you need a dream sequence in your life. And trust me, you do. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for coming on the show, Ryan. Thanks for uh, talking about broken gear and, uh, yeah, really appreciate it. Yeah, man. Good talking to you. Very good talking to you. So I guess I'll wrap this thing up. So for Ryan... I'm Blake, and as always, folks, good luck and good tones. I'm totally serious. You guys have to go check out the dream sequence. It is nuts. I know. I know. I won't shut up about it. I refuse to shut up about it until you go look at it. It's, it's really cool. So links in the show notes. Um, check it out there. Also, um, the fuzz pedal sold out. The Model 1 is gone. You guys, you guys rock. That went really, really fast. Um... Thank you very much for the support. I'm glad that uh, everybody seems to be digging it. So that's really cool. I kind of consider that to be the first domino of many. There's a lot of projects in the works, some of which are going to be announced very soon. Um, it's super exciting stuff. Like there's some killer companies that I've been working with on some really wicked projects. So stay tuned for that. Hop on the Tone Mob mailing list and you'll see that stuff very soon. Also, don't forget, uh, it's been a while since I've received a review. So if you're tuning in, you're liking what you're hearing, please head over to iTunes and go ahead and put a review in there, and I'd really appreciate it. All right, talk to you next time. Bye. One last thing before we totally sign off here, I just want to remind you, that if you do any shopping at Stringjoy, that's Stringjoy Guitar Strings made in Nashville, that will help me out as well. As I've said for years, I'm heavily involved in that company, and I really do think they're making the best products on the market. So if you would like to try custom strings, go to ToneMob.com Stringjoy and check them out today. I seriously, seriously, seriously love what the team down there is doing. I help them out with all kinds of things, and by you supporting them, you are also supporting me as well. And hey, you need some strings, so why not get some custom strings just for your guitar and playing style? Again, the link for that is ToneMob.com stringjoy, 
and that will take you right to their website and you can do all your shopping through there and that will help everyone involved out. So thank you very much. Talk to you next time. We are brought to you by the wonderful folks at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Yes, Gun Street Wiring Shop. I've talked about them before. I used to say based out of Bend, Oregon, but guess what? Sean moved to my neck of the woods. Sean's in Portland. Sean is awesome and has helped me with a bunch of stuff lately. And if you have wiring needs for your guitar, he can help you too. If you want to get weird with it, he can get weird. If you just need to spruce things up a little bit, there's your guy. He takes all the guesswork out of doing your guitar wiring, and he makes it simple, and his customer service is top-notch, and I can't say enough good things about Gunstreet as a company. I really respect Sean and what he's all about, and the product is top-notch. I've got three different guitars that now have Gunstreet harnesses in them, and I could not be happier. So go to GunstreetWiringShop.com and check them out.